podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. Let's uh, start our last lecture on this subject. So, uh, at this moment, we've developed quite a lot of technical results on duality. And um, in particular, the exercises that some of you played with uh, familiarized you with some of the properties of uh, ODD transformations. And the emphasis was on the objects and how they transform under ODD transformations. And we had two kinds of objects, objects that transform, we said in the fundamental, when we had a ODD element H, little h, which was a set of matrices that satisfy H transpose eta H equal eta. And there were a set of objects that transformed with this matrices H. And those were nice, simple objects. Like, for example, the coordinates X, M that we group them, this run over 2D indices, and they have the coordinates xi tilde and the coordinates xi, for i run from 1 up to d. And an object like xm transforms under a t-duality transformation, like x prime is equal to hx. And then we had another set of objects that transform with matrices M and M bar. M bar that controlled the transformation properties, the transformation properties of these derivatives that we had of the metric of variations of uh, E, they were all controlled by matrices M and M bar that were essentially of the form C, E plus D, or things like that, or with some transpose of objects like that. We built a double field theory, and uh, we did it to quadratic order and to cubic order, and then, uh, we discussed the constraint that was a stronger version of the constraint that we've been using so far. We said that all fields have to be annihilated by DD tilde on all fields. This can be written in terms of this capital M indices. You have derivatives dm that are ddi and di tilde, they, this constraint can be written as just dm, dm equals zero as well. That's a way to write it in what we would call manifestly ODD invariant way. And uh, we now require that not only all fields are annihilated by this, but also all products of fields are annihilated by that. So, in particular, for any fields A and B, such that D M, D M of A is equal to D M, D M of B is equal to zero, you also want that D M, D M of the product be zero. And that requires D M A, D M B equal to zero. So we decided to impose such constraint even though it reduces the relevance of the construction to a subset of double field theory because it will allow us to go to all orders and identify the geometrical structures we're interested in. So the task for today is to identify those structures and finally write um, doubled Lagrangians that are background independent that have rather nice properties. So 
I'm going to be following the lecture notes. Uh, we have about half of lecture two to finish, and uh, um, I produce a lecture three that is also outside. Um, if you don't have it, it might be worth getting it, at least in about half a 45 minutes. And uh, it's a shorter lecture, but uh, it still has uh, the main things that I wanted to cover without going too fast. So basically, let's begin then with uh, the subject of today, which is uh, current brackets. And uh, this will look like a small detour, but uh, it will really be at the foundation of what we're going to get, so it's worth understanding it. So I'm going to go through it the way you would go if you were looking at this problem, and I think uh, you would probably, or we would probably, if we were doing it, stop at one place and be a little puzzled, and we would need physical input. So the idea that, uh, of this is that you have a theory with a metric, Gij, and a Kalbramon field, Bij. And they depend just on some coordinates. Uh, I'm going to follow the way mathematicians do this, and they s really don't like to double things. And, um, and they're puzzled when you tell them that you should be doubling stuff. So a theory of G and B has symmetries, and the symmetries of G are defined by vector fields that generate diffeomorphisms, objects with an index up, or vector fields. The symmetries of B are defined by one forms. I will write them as psi i down at this moment. And they also depend on the coordinates. And uh, the vectors without indices belong to the tangent space of the manifold M, where x is in some manifold M. And uh, the one forms belong to the cotangent bundle. And as I mentioned before, uh, we would simply put them together and call this a section of the sum of bundles, Tm plus T star m. Now, what are the gauge transformations? I'm going to use a slightly geometric language uh, to describe them. Um, I hope it is somewhat familiar. If it's not that familiar, uh, I think it's worthwhile learning it. And you, I don't think you'll be lost as I go along using this notation. So let's write gauge transformation. So delta. And what is the gauge parameter? So now each time I want to write the gauge parameter, I should say v and xi, but I will just write v plus xi. There's no confusion in putting them together. So I write delta v plus xi of the metric, and I will not put indices. Try to work without indices. And what are you supposed to do? Well, we know that. Uh, the V generates diffeomorphism, so the way we think of the gauge transformations of G is that it's nothing else but the lead derivative along the direction of the vector V of G. That's a lead derivative. Uh, this can be thought as an infinitesimal parameter V. And uh, that's it. The xi parameter doesn't enter here. On the other hand, the gauge transformation of the anti-symmetric tensor is a little more complicated because it's just a tensor, has its indices, so you must still do the lead derivative of B. But this time, the familiar gauge transformations of the Kalbramond field are that this being a one form, you take an exterior derivative, it's a two form, just like that. So those are the famous uh, 
gauge transformations of these things. And um, we can recall a few properties that are going to be useful in general. And one very famous property is that on forms, the lead derivative along a vector can be calculated by doing two operations, a contraction with a vector times the exterior derivative plus the exterior derivative times the contraction with a vector. So if you're acting on a form, uh, you act with this thing, and that's the same as taking a lead derivative, and that helps you calculate. Um, the contraction with a vector is a natural thing. You know, forms are objects that give numbers when you supply the right number of vectors. This basically says supply one vector and contract it with a form. And uh, this is easy to use and you don't have to do combinatorics and factors if you use identities of this form. From this identity, it follows that, for example, the lead derivative and the exterior derivative commute. You can check that. You get the same result if you put the d on the left or the d on the right, because d squared is 0. Uh, if you want indices, there's a notation with indices, for example, for the metric, which is not a, a two-form. Um, it's a slightly, it's a two-tensor. So the lead derivative along a vector of g i j, we write it as v i v k g k j plus v j v k G i k plus v k v k g i j. So that's the familiar lead derivative of a symmetric tensor. So when we operate with these objects, there's yet a couple of identities that are useful. Lead derivatives are very nice because, as their name indicates, they form a Lie algebra. If you have a Lie derivative with respect to one vector field V1 and a Lie derivative with respect to another vector field V2, you get that this is equal to the Lie derivative with respect to another vector field, which is V1, V2. Now, there are several brackets here, and they should not be confused. This uh, bracket means anti-commutator. So you act with LV1, LV2, minus LV2, LV1. And the result is just a single lead derivative with yet a new vector. This is a bracket of vectors. Now, a bracket of vectors is a nice notation for an operation that is relatively clear. If you have v1, v2, it's a vector. The bracket of two vectors is a vector. Its uh, k component is equal to v1, p, v, p, v2, k, minus 1 and 2 symmetrized. So it's it's another vector whose components are given by this thing. It's called the Lie bracket of vectors. There's another identity that is, will be useful is that Lx iy is equal to i of xy. All right, so, so suppose you're faced with constructing a theory of a metric and an antisymmetric uh, tensor field, and they tell you, OK, those are the gauge transformations. You would ask, so what is the gauge algebra? Can we determine the gauge algebra? So we should compute the, a couple of transformations in reverse order and see what we get. So for example, we can do delta v2 plus xi2 commutator delta 
V1 plus Xi1 on the metric and see what we get. This is not hard. We have delta, say, V2 plus Xi2 of delta V1 plus Xi1 on G, but that's LV1 on G. And I have to do minus 1, 2. And now the second gauge transformation just acts on the field, so it goes in, and then you get LV1 and then LV2 from here on G minus 1, 2. So we can use our identity that the commutator of two LVs is another LV. So this is all equal to LV1, V2 on G. And that's pretty nice. Uh, we would have imagined that somehow the commutator algebra involves the Lie bracket, and it's here. Now let's do the case of the anti-symmetric tensor, which is a little more subtle. And uh, we have it here, delta V1 plus Xi1 on B. So I get delta V2 plus Xi2 on LV1 of B plus V Xi1 minus 1, 2. I used the transformation of B there. Now I have to act again, so, well, I have to do a gauge transformation. This is not a field, so I don't care about this. So we get LV1 of B of the variation of B, which will be LV2 of B plus V Xi2 minus 1, 2. And that's good. So let's uh, write this a little more explicitly. Well, for example, D and L commute, we said. Now, the, this term, LV1 and LV2 forms an LV1 commutator with V2, so it's LV1, V2. And I could write here, because the D commutes with LV1, D of LV1 Xi2 minus LV2 Xi1. Okay. So we can compare with our gauge transformations, and what do we conclude? We conclude that as far as we can see, delta V2 plus Xi2, delta V1 plus Xi1, it's another delta, as it should be. The commutator of two gauge transformations the should be another gauge transformation. But with what parameter? Well, I have to find the vector parameter and the one form parameter. You need the two of them. What is the vector parameter? Well, the vector parameter shows up with a Lie derivative. And here I see, yes, the Lie derivative of this. And this is the Lie derivative of that on the transformation of V. So yes, the vector parameter is V1, V2. Now how about the one form parameter? Well, the one form parameter shows up in the transformation of the anti-symmetric tensor as a D psi. So here looks like we got the one form parameter. So LV1 of Xi2 minus LV2 of Xi1. Now, here comes uh, a little bit of notation, but uh, this is the notation that we want to use. Look at this formula. Uh, this bracket of two vectors gives you a vector. So it's natural to define the bracket of these generalized gauge parameters. How? We simply say that if you have one gauge parameter, um, 
There's an issue of a little sign here that uh, perhaps I'm not sure I'm getting absolutely consistent, but, um, but here it is, B2 plus Xi2. So think of a way to encode the gauge parameters, how they're combining. Uh, well, here is a bracket for the generalized gauge parameters, vector plus one form, vector plus one form. And if I read it from here, the natural thing to say is that basically I want to write the right-hand side as delta of V1 plus Xi1, V2 plus Xi2. This is the analog that you would have in gravity that you would say delta of V1, delta of V2 is equal to delta of V1 bracket with V2. So here we would have a bracket that would be V1, V2 plus LV1 Xi2 minus LV2 Xi1. And this would seem a rather nice bracket. In fact, it is a reasonably nice bracket. Um, the gauge algebra seems to be defined by this bracket. If you have a gauge transformation with this parameter, another with this, and you commute them, you get a gauge transformation with this parameter. That's the definition of a bracket. But um, in doing this, we've been a little uh, careless and um, we have to repair that. What is the carelessness? The carelessness is that, uh, in fact, there's so much ambiguity in this that you can't quite determine the gauge parameters uniquely. Um, you think you did, and uh, maybe I even convinced you that this was totally legal, but it was not. At a step, I was, I could have done something different and gotten a different result. Let me clarify that. We have the gauge transformation of B is LVB plus D Xi, and it's clearly equal to the gauge transformation if you change, instead of Xi, you put a D, sig D sigma. It's the same because if you change the one form by an exact one form, it would do nothing to it. You would have the same with uh, LVB plus D of Xi plus D sigma, and that would disappear. So I have a possible ambiguity, and it was here that I was a little careless with this ambiguity. I can add things to this that wouldn't change the result. So in particular, if I have D of LV1 Xi2 uh, minus 1, 2, for example, let's look at it again. We had this D of this, and we identified this as the one form. But in fact, that one form is crying out for an ambiguity. This is D IV of Xi2 plus IV D of Xi2 minus 1, 2. And this part wouldn't contribute. And it comes with a coefficient 1. But we could have put another coefficient there. You could put pi or three or, or anything, any number here, and say that this remains the same. This one I can't change because that is not killed. But here, here is an exact part. The lead derivative has an exact part and uh, another part here. So without loss of generality, I can put here d. And I'm going to change this. I'm going to change it for a coefficient 1 minus beta over 2, d i v 
of xi2 plus iv of v xi2 minus 1, 2. And why 1 minus beta over 2? Well, uh, the 1 is convenient because the 1 is this term plus this term is a lead derivative. So that, that's nice to keep it. And in fact, this is the whole ambiguity. So I would have d of LV1 Xi2 minus 1 half beta D of IV1 Xi2 minus 1, 2. I just expanded it out and recognized that this 1 and this 1 combine to form the lead derivative again. So if I just write this explicitly, I got LV1 of Xi2 minus LV2 of Xi1 minus 1 half beta D of IV1 Xi2 minus IV2 Xi1. So at the end of the day, I have um, let's see that I really might have misidentified the one form in there, and maybe I should have defined a more general bracket v1 plus xi1 v2 plus xi2 with a beta equals to v1 v2 plus lv1 xi2 minus lv2 xi1 minus one half of beta times d of iv1 xi2 minus iv2 xi1. At least if I'm honest, I should have put that beta at the very least. Uh, now you could say, well, why don't you add d of any form? Any form. Uh, well, I could, but it's not natural because it should be a form that is constructed with xi's and v's. And this is the only way you can construct the form with xi's and v's. Uh, in fact, this is a function. You contract v with xi's and you take the exterior derivative. So, all right, so we have the ambiguity in front of our eyes and uh, there is this bracket, and actually this bracket on the face of it looks nicer than this one. First, this is more messy, but second, uh, if you have a bracket, uh, you ask whether it's a Lie bracket in some sense, and a Lie bracket means that it would satisfy a Jacobi identity. So you can ask, does this satisfy a Jacobi identity? And the answer is yes. It does satisfy a Jacobi identity. How about this bracket? Does it satisfy a Jacobi identity? And the answer is no. As long as you keep beta different from one, from um, zero, uh, it doesn't satisfy a Jacobi identity. So it looks a little unpleasant at first sight. So, that is the puzzle that you have in a field theory of antisymmetric tensors and gravity. The gauge algebra is somewhat undetermined, and you have a natural choice that has a Jacobi identity and some betas that don't have a Jacobi identity. So there comes uh, Mr. Courant in 1990 and says the right value of beta is 1. And uh, forget about the Jacobi identity. We don't need it so much. What we need is one over there. So what happens then? Let's um, discuss that. So um, this two go down, and this goes up. 
So Quran says you should take beta equal to 1. And that's the famous Quran bracket. So let's see why that is interesting. It's not very useful. That's the problem. So, um, so we're I'm sorry. It's taking me several steps to get this right. Okay. So we should take Quran says beta equals to one, and uh, that's the interesting thing to work with. There's nothing necessarily wrong with taking another beta, but uh, in a theory, you may want to display as many symmetries as you can. And uh, there are more symmetries when you have beta equals to 1. So Quran says beta equals to 1. And uh, therefore, the Quran bracket becomes this relatively nice V1 plus Xi1, V2 plus Xi2, equal V1, V2, plus LV1 Xi2 minus LV2 Xi1 minus 1 half V of IV1 Xi2 minus IV2 Xi1. No Jacobi identity uh, for this bracket. If you compute uh, three things, a, a nested bracket with three things, and cycle it, it just doesn't give you zero. Now, what is special about this bracket, and the way mathematicians explain it, is that there is an extra automorphism, extra symmetry. Symmetry. What is that symmetry? It's, it's called an automorphism, morphism, which means that if you do an operation on the elements, it respects the bracket. So if you have one element and another element that the bracket gives you a third element, there's an operation on the elements that moves the first to this, the second to this, and the third to that, in such a way that the moved ones also satisfy the bracket. So that's an automorphism. So here is the automorphism. Given a closed two form, B, that satisfies VB equals 0, any element x plus xi will be changed in, in a way that you change xi. How? Well, x plus psi will go to x plus psi plus ix of b. So that changes psi because b is a two form. You put contractor vector is a one form, so you're changing the one form. And uh, this is an automorphism, which means the following. Uh, that x plus xi plus ix of b. So you do the b transformation of x plus xi. So you add ix of b. Do the b transformation of y plus eta. So you must add i y of b. The B transformation always adds I of the vector of your element on B. So this should give you the B transformation of the original bracket. So it should be the original bracket, the vector, the original bracket, plus the B transformation of it, which is the contraction with the vector of the bracket on B. That is to say that the algebra has an automorphism. The bracket has an automorphism, more precisely. So you've changed psi here, eta here, and you change the result by adding to it 
the contraction of the vector on B as well. Now, so this is a computation. I left it as an exercise to verify, to try to calculate the automorphism in general. So you take the general bracket with beta and see if it has this automorphism. And you will find that it selects beta equals zero. Only with beta equals zero you get the automorphism. So we have an extra symmetry there. Now, there's an inter... Yes? Um, beta equal one is for this particular automorphism, absolutely. So I have to motivate why this automorphism is interesting or is relevant and why we should want it. I suspect you cannot find any other automorphism from any other value of beta. We would know about it if there were, but I cannot promise you. <laughs> other questions? So why do people think of this as uh, an interesting um, automorphism? Uh, you know, it's basically it's the issue of symmetries. If you have a manifold and you have a metric, say, we say that a vector field is a symmetry of that metric if the lead derivative with respect to the vector field of the metric is zero. That defines isometries. We say that V is an isometry if the lead derivative of the metric is zero. So what happens if you have a B? Well, when you have a B, you could say, well, I have a symmetry if the lead derivative of B is equal to zero. But that's a little too restrictive. It's better to say that you have a symmetry if you don't change B in any physical way, but B has gauge transformation. So it's possible that uh, the change in B is an exact uh, two form, in which case you can remove the change of B by a gauge transformation, and you haven't done anything. So a symmetry, V plus Xi is a symmetry, of B if this is true. And the claim is now that if you have a close, a close to form, form, B, the B that we've been talking about in this automorphism, a close to form, it's natural to add it to our little b. So you could consider um, the two form B that becomes B plus B. And you could ask, what are the symmetries of the new two form? So the original two form had this symmetry described by V plus Xi. What is the symmetry of this one? Well, the answer is that it has a symmetry, symmetry, which is in fact V plus Xi plus IV of B, which is the B transformation, the B automorphism of this element. So this is the claim. So we can check it uh, rather easily. LV of the new B plus B would be LV of B plus, and we can discuss what L is explicitly, write it down. So we have VIV plus IVD on B. So this is equal, um, I'm sorry, I didn't copy this. Um, no, this is fine. It's LV of B 
is d psi, so we have this, d psi. This is zero, and this is d of i v b, so v b. So that's correct. This has this symmetry because the Lie derivative of this new field is equal to d of the new gauge parameter. So what this says is that if you have a manifold with a beef here, there's always, and you have a symmetry, that symmetry survives if you add to b this b. And it survives with a little modification. The gauge parameter for that symmetry is this automorphism. So basically, these two situations with little b or b plus capital B are physically equivalent. So it was natural for mathematicians to demand that this automorphism, that this symmetry, this possible transformation, be an automorphism of the bracket. Yes? I'm sorry, in equation what? 51? Yes. Oh, it, you know, psi or minus psi doesn't make a difference. Uh, so I guess if you wish, you could put a minus here or just call it this way. It, it, it's, it, it doesn't make a difference. So, um, let me see where we are, 24, 25. Okay. So, let's go ahead and uh, see how this relates to our field theory. So, let's uh, go up. So I'm going to present a result that will come later, but since we want to connect to current brackets, let's present it right now and see what it has to do with it. So, okay. So we said we would construct a theory that is strongly constrained. And uh, this theory can be constructed to all orders, as you will see soon. And uh, you can look at the gauge algebra of it. And the gauge algebra came out to be something uh, a little unusual. And I want to show it to you and then display the relation with the current bracket. So we have, in the strongly constrained theory we would try to build, a gauge parameter psi m, which will be of the form psi i, psi i. So I used to call the vectors v and psi, psi the one forms. I'm going to go to a uniform notation in which a vector is psi and the one form is psi tilde. Now here it is what uh, the algebra of gauge transformations turns out to be when you construct this theory that I will show you a little later. When you have a psi 1 and a psi 2, you will have a bracket that we call it the C bracket because it's somewhat closely related to the current bracket. Now, I want to display, I need to display probably an index. So this is a psi m with another psi m. This should be, a, should give the m component. And the first term here is the usual Lie bracket, psi 1, p, dp, psi 2, m, and you must anti-symmetrize in one and two. 
If this bracket, the algebra of the gauge transformations in the theory, was just a Lie bracket, it would be like this. Now, there is an extra term, a surprising term. One half eta mn eta pq psi 1 p bn psi 2 q. You probably don't need to copy many of the things I'm going to be writing because they're in the notes. Maybe it's just better to listen. So what did I do? Well, the m index is up, and I put it with an eta here and a derivative down. The you see, gauge parameters have naturally their ODD index up. And of course, they have components in I indices that can be up and down. But the ODD index is up. Derivatives have naturally the ODD index down. But now, this term would be absurd in a generally, in a familiar theory because you don't want to put a metric into an object like this that is supposed to be geometric. It should not depend on the metric on the manifold. But we have a special metric, this eta metric. It's a constant metric, and we may be forgiven if we use it. In fact, we're going to use it and put it here. And this is used to contract P and Q and to raise this index. So I could write this a little more um, uh, implicitly as psi 1 dot d psi 2 m bracket, and then minus 1 half psi 1 p b m here psi 2 Now, I would ask you to look at page 26 of the notes. And uh, we will try to identify what this means. You see, this is very compact notation. And we call it the C bracket. But uh, we may want to look at it in more explicit language. So I could put that psi 1 is equal to psi 1 plus psi 1 tilde. A little bit of a abuse of notation. This psi 1 sort of has the capital index M, is the total parameter, is the vector parameter plus the one form parameter, and the same for psi 2. So I could write a formula that I won't write, psi 1 plus psi 1 tilde, psi 2 plus psi 2 tilde, being equal to something in which I split this into vector parameters and one forms and see what I get. Well, the answer is there, it's in page 26. It's a little long, it's a boxed equation. And uh, it has several terms. Oh, it's, it's 25 in the notes that you have. I'm sorry, I had a numbering confusion. So it's, thank you very much, Michael. So it's 25. So the bracket has several terms, and I, sh I can walk you through them. And in particular, has a couple of funny things. Um, it has L psi tildes and L psi's. And this is a, a little unusual. In particular, you know what is the Lie derivative along a vector field, but you probably never heard of a Lie derivative along a one form. Nevertheless, the Lie derivative along a one form usually doesn't work because the coordinates have the index up, the derivative have the index down, but now you have the dual coordinates, the x tilde. So there's a perfectly natural lead derivative of one form, along a one form, that uses the fact that the indices are in the other position. 
Similarly, you, you may have heard, of course, of a Lie bracket of two vectors, psi 1 and psi 2, but not of the Lie bracket of two 1 forms. What in the world could that be? But that's perfectly okay if you have dual derivatives because you would say the ith component of this, because it's a one form, would be psi 1 p d tilde p of psi 2 i, um, the 2 and 1 anti-symmetric. So the tilde derivatives allow you to define the bracket of a Lie bracket of two forms and the Lie derivative along one form because everything is double. Now if you see this formula we had there in page 69, um, in page 26, I'm sorry, is formula 69, you can also see what happens if you don't double the coordinates. If all the things that depend on the doubling of coordinates are gone, what should you cross out? Well, you should cross out the L psi derivatives. That should be crossed out. They should, you should cross out the bracket of two one forms. And you should cross out what we call the D tilde derivative, which is just like when with one forms you do di dxi, well, this would be di tilde dxi tilde. So these ones also disappear. The, D, the exterior derivative along the dual coordinates disappear. And what you see there that is left, shown in, page, in the next page, 26, formula 70, is that this whole C bracket has become the current bracket. So the symmetry of the double field theory that we're going to construct is based on the C bracket, which is the ODD invariant generalization of the current bracket. By the time you drop half of the coordinates, you're down to the current bracket. So it's a little mysterious at first sight why you would have um, this thing. But uh, we can now explain uh, the origin of this transformation as well, as follows. We basically need to understand if the mathematicians were looking at, at um, B transformations, well, what are those really for us? And uh, we'll see that right away. So, okay. So, go back to ODD transformations, H. An element of ODD is the following matrix, 1. And now I have no good letter for this. I'll put a B like that. But we have several Bs already, so I hope it doesn't confuse you. Uh, a 1 and a 0 in here where this is anti-symmetric constant. And this belongs to ODD. So what does it do? Well, if you act with H on an E, what you get is E on 1 plus B and nothing else, the other matrix is the identity. So actually this takes E to E prime, which is E plus B, which just means that G has been taken to G, 
and capital B has been taken to capital B plus little b. So when we were doing it <laughs> in the mathematics language, we thought of a manifold with a little form B and you add a capital B, but the way we think in duality is we have a B and now I add the little b. So I just reverse the roles. And what does it do? Well, the gauge parameters, remember, Xi m were of the form Xi tilde i, Xi i. So they are going to transform. And how will they transform? Well, um, they will go into 1, B, 0, 1, acting on Xi i psi so what happens psi i tilde goes to psi i tilde plus b psi i or you know i can erase the indices i think will be clearer psi tilde goes to psi tilde plus b psi and what is this this is the matrix product of this matrix times the parameter in here. So basically, you've changed the one form by adding the vector times the matrix. So our T dualities that correspond to adding anti-symmetric constants here that shift the kalb ramon background are precisely the analog in our compactification of the B transformations that the mathematicians had. Since this t-duality must be a manifest symmetry of our theory, we are forced to have a gauge algebra that has this as a manifest symmetry, thus the current bracket had to appear. So it is our aim uh, that we wanted a t-duality covariant formulation that actually brings this result. So uh, I wrote this C bracket, and I said, well, that's the gauge algebra of the theory, but I still didn't write the theory. So in the last half hour, we'll write the theory. We know enough to be able to have an intuition why it works, not to do all the details, of course, but uh, to have a feeling of why everything is working and why the symmetries have appeared. Yes. Yeah. This C bracket will come from a calculation that I will do now. So um, you will, if you do the last exercise of this uh, set of lectures, it will be the calculation of the C bracket from a, a simple computation. It's not difficult, really. Sorry? Sure. Sure, you have an out the same, a similar automorphism. Okay, so let me um, go on. Let's see. one second. So what do we have to do? Well, uh, we have to be actually recognize that a lot of what we derived is true under more general circumstances. So this will be our first task. And uh, basically, we work with these capital E's that were background fields. And we constructed a little field theory with uh, fluctuations. And uh, now we want to put background and fluctuations together. So that's what we will do. And uh, so I begin now with uh, what we have in the third lecture. You can follow the notes again. It um, might be easier. So what did we have? We wrote a double field theory with a background EIJ. And the field was a little EIJ that depended on x and x tilde. Now you know we use xm for x tilde and uh, x like this. So 
it's very natural to think that at the end of the day, you don't want an explicit separation between background and fluctuation. That's why you don't have manifest background independence, because they're separate. You want them together. So the field, the natural field in the theory should be a field EIJ that depends on X and X tilde, so I put this capital X, and it's roughly expected to be EIJ plus the fluctuation plus maybe up to field redefinitions, the fluctuation squared or other things. Uh, we don't know. There might be nice ways of doing this and not so nice ways. Now, if we have an EIJ, well, I knew how this transform under T-duality. I knew how this transform under T-duality. There is a natural way to say how this transforms under T-duality. Remember, x prime is equal to h x, where h is a, b, c, d. So for this ones, we're going to say something quite similar, that e prime is equal to a, e plus b, c, e plus d, minus 1, but now they depend on position, so this should be of x, this should be of x, and this should be of x prime. Remember when you have in general rel relativity a scalar, it's defined as saying that phi prime at x prime is equal to phi at x. So I should put the transform field at the transform position is equal to this thing. So this is what one would naturally think should be the duality transformation by the time you're all set and done. And if this is true, well, a lot of the algebra that we did should be true. In particular, for the dilaton, the dilaton that we use in our theory is expected to be t-duality invariant, ODD invariant, so you would expect this. This is the analog of a scalar. Now, you know, all the identities that you've been proving on, and we talked about and transformations do not depend on the fact that E depended on X or it didn't. So, for example, many of the things have immediate generalization. So, for example, your DIs that were of DI minus EIK DK, remember those derivatives, well, put the curly thing here and call them curly. And similarly for the d bar i's, d i plus e k i d tilde k. But now the full metric. It's a strange object, but uh, we have that. And then they will transform with the M matrices. The M matrices were, for example, D minus C, E transpose, transpose. Well, now they depend on X. So E here, curly E. And they will trans things will transform with M and M bars because everything sort of came from this and you really never had to take derivatives to derive these identities. So in particular, even the generalized metric that had things like G minus B, G minus 1, B, and things like that, now I'll write H not of capital E, but of curly E, and it's going to be G minus B, G minus 1, B, and everything in terms of G and B. So, you know, you could review everything and see what has happened to every identity, but I'm telling you that everything we did carries through essentially with this thing. There's a small complication when you take many derivatives. You see, these derivatives transform nicely and covariantly, like di 
was equal to m d bar i, d bar, I'm sorry, m d prime. d was equal to m d prime. Now before, m was a constant. So if you had two derivatives, they would just pile together and everything would be ODD covariant. But now if you have more than one derivative, the derivative can hit the m and you can get in trouble. So let's try not to write more than one derivative. That's the only thing that really we have to watch out. All right, so here we go. We can write our first action. Um, more or less ready. Okay. So how is this action going to look? It's in pa page 31. I will still write it, even though uh, it's there in the notes. It's an action for the E field and D. And it's on DX, DX tilde, E to the minus 2D. Remember, the dilaton really is a density. There's no point and no need and no way to introduce a square root of minus G there. And let me write one term and look at it for a second. G I K G J L D P E K L D P E I J. All right. Now, again, at this moment, this looks perfectly okay. And it's ODV covariant. Why? Because one derivative of an E field is ODD covariant. Remember, E transforms projectively, but derivatives of E transform with M and M bar. And there's just one derivative. So this will produce an M inverse for P, an M for K, an M bar for L. And these things will do the right job. This L and J can be thought as barred. Remember, G is funny that you can think its indices as bar or unbarred, and G, I, K contract these two indices, and everything is ODD invariant. Yes? Sorry? This sign, uh, that, well, I hope I didn't copy it wrong. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's right. Um, um, I don't think you can compare 31. Um, hmm. It does look a little different indeed. Um, oh, no. It's, uh, you see, in 41, you have two derivatives. And so there's an integration by parts necessary to go to that one. This one has, you, you know, I cannot put two derivatives. The other one had a box. But if I put a box, it would not be ODD covariant. I have to write it like this. The integration, you see, if I try to integrate this by parts, it's complicated. This is not a usual covariant derivative. This doesn't kill this, doesn't kill this, doesn't kill the dilaton. So if I try to into integrate it by parts, I get into trouble. OK, there's a couple more terms. Uh, one fourth GKL 
B, J, E, I, K, D, I, E, J, L, plus things like that, plus 4, D, I, D, D, I, D. So here it is, a natural double field theory, and uh, every term, because of the index contractions, is ODD covariant. So ODD covariance, in fact, is not that dramatic. It doesn't fix the whole action. You could add lots of terms that are ODD covariant. The thing that fixes the action is the gauge invariance. So there's a particular combination of these numbers that fixes the, um, the consistency. Now, how could this, how was this found? Well, I showed you a couple of, yesterday, uh, the action to quadratic order and cubic order. So you could have just said, well, I'll try to write something that reduces to that action when I expand by using uh, that E is equal to E plus fluctuations. And in fact, that fixes this quite uniquely. And uh, very quickly, you realize that either this is right or there's no answer to the problem. And it turns out this is right. How can you check that this is right in a deeper sense? Well, um, the real thing that should happen is that it's already ODD covariant under uh, the transformations that we wrote for E and the dilaton. Uh, you must have general coordinate invariance. So the thing that you can do is set, for example, the tilde derivative is equal to zero. And then this must reduce to the standard Einstein action plus anti-symmetric tensor field plus dilaton. And it's not a difficult computation to check that when you put all the tilde derivatives to zero and disassemble the E into G plus B and expand, you get exactly the right answer. Uh, it takes a couple of hours to check it probably. Um, so that's one action. And uh, it has nice gauge transformations as well. Um, maybe I'll mention them because they're rather pretty. Delta Xi of Eij, it has the kalb ramond one, Di Xi J D tilde minus Dj Xi I tilde. Then it has the lead derivative with respect to Xi of Eij plus the Lie derivative with respect to Xi tilde of Eij, plus one funny term, minus one funny term, Eik d tilde k Xi L minus d tilde L Xi k Elj. So what, is this natural? Yes, it's quite natural. This is the kalb ramon linearized gauge transformation. It had to be here. Then this is the familiar transformation. If you don't have tilde derivatives, L xi tilde vanishes and this d tilde vanishes, all this is gone, and this is what you would expect. Li derivatives plus kalb ramon gauge parameters. If you have x and x tilde, you must have this derivative and this tilde derivative. And here, it is the analog of the kalb ramon transformation, but with tilde derivatives. In a sense, under x, under this t-duality that changes x's for x tildes, this term becomes this. You might say, it doesn't quite look the same. This has extra e's. But actually, when x is changing to x tilde and vice versa, e is changing to the inverse of e. And uh, therefore, those inverses sort of show up there. So this is quite uh, all right. So that's one action that I wanted to show you. And uh, nevertheless, computing the gauge algebra here is messy. Uh, 
and proving the gauge invariance of this action is a little difficult, though the action is just three lines long and it's uh, in many ways quite elegant. And it answers the question of writing, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, you have R plus V phi squared plus H squared. It doesn't use the, met the field E in any natural way. You use the metric for R, then the symmetric field for H, and they don't come together. Here they come very nicely together in terms of E, and it puts it all in a nice way. So this is a form of the action in terms of E that it seems it was not known before. And perhaps that's not too surprising because the key to getting that form was doubling things. This will become even more obvious in the next action I will write. Yes. 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 No, the yeah, the con you know, the condition is the same. So you still must have the d dot d tilde that kills anything. So you know, that's the condition. I, the fact that I wrote the action without using second derivatives is independent of that. But when you check the gauge invariance or when you check all kinds of properties, you will have to use this. But uh, that, that's not a problem. The action, I wrote it in a nice way so that the ODD transformations are manifest. If I wrote it with second order derivatives, the ODD covariance would not be obvious, but it would still be true. Uh, yes. This thing? Yes. So actually, this being equal to zero has many ways of writing. In the original language, was d squared equal d squared. And it with curvilinear ones, uh, with this curly derivative, there's another way. It's dA dB is equal to d bar A d bar B. There are several ways of writing the condition, but you, you don't need to worry. You, this is really what you want. OK, let's do the other action so that we can see. see yes, one second. Um, Yes. It's a global symmetry because the gauge parameters are, uh, don't have x dependent. So at the end of the day, it's a symmetry generated by h, which is a, b, c, d. But uh, the transformations uh, you know, are very complicated. But the symmetry is global. A, B, C, Absolutely. a, b, c, and d are always constant. So I don't know, it's up there. A, B, C, and D are constants. M's are not constants, but that's, that's OK. You know, the symmetry is ultimately defined by the group element, and those are constants. So we have this H, M, N, which was the generalized metric. So now the idea is to write an action in terms of the generalized metric. Um, so, let me talk about it. So, I'll write an action, presumably, or in fact, is the same action that I wrote above, but it's written in terms of the generalized metric, and it's going to be somewhat more elegant in many ways. So, what happens with the generalized metric? Remember, the ODD transformations of those were very simple just by matrix action from the left and from the right. Therefore, again, with ODD indices, all I have to do is contract them nicely 
and I got an action. So for example, you know, for the dilaton, you have there 4di di of the dilaton, this term. Look, the E field is inside the derivative. The E field is inside the derivative. This is quite complicated. Well, what could be the analog of that term? The analog of that term is, well, you have one derivative on a dilaton. Let's just use normal derivatives, dmd. dnd. Now I have to contract them. I could use an eta or an h, but an eta is the wrong thing. If I put an eta mn here, this is just, I raise the indices d m d d m d, and uh, at some moment I explain that the constraint at the beginning of this lecture is d m a d m b equals zero for anything. So uh, that would be zero. So that's not good. So what can you put? You can put HMN. And that's good. That's pretty much the only thing you could do. And uh, you have the formula for HMN. It takes about five minutes to realize that by the time you unscramble this and you put the generalized method, this thing is the same. And this was ODD covariant, but that was a little more complicated is because there's two derivatives that transform with this and an inverse metric in here and they cancel, but here the indices just match. So ODD covariance is manifest. And this is this term. So actually there's a surprising rewriting and you know, I, I think for many for quite a while, people thought, well, if the generalized metric is so important, why can't we use it to write an action? Well, this is what we're going to see. The Einstein action can be written in terms of a generalized metric. It's HMN, the MHKL, the NHKL. And that term, actually, if you compute it using the formula for the generalized metric, is exactly this minus one quarter g i k j is the first term there. It just comes out. This term is manifestly ODD invariant because every index is contracted. Well, there's uh, another term that I wrote there, um, minus one half h m n d n h k l the L H M K and a minus two D M D D N H M N. You want to write a coupling of uh, gravity and the dilaton with two derivatives. When one goes to the dilaton, one goes to the generalized metric. There's only one way to write it. Just like this term with a four. So only one way to write it. Very quickly you realize that there's only one way to write this thing and it actually corresponds to the dilaton metric term that is up there that I didn't write. So at the end of the day, that's it. Those are the four terms. That action is uh, identical to that action, although it's not obvious at all why. And this action, again, if you take the tilde derivatives to zero, reduces to Einstein's action, and is ODD covariant, and it has a gauge symmetry. And the discussion of the gauge symmetry is going to take me my last uh, few minutes. Um, it is quite surprising and uh, pretty elegant, so you might like it. Sorry? No, it always has two derivatives, every term. Derivative of dilaton, derivative of the metric, one derivative, another, one, and another, and two there. Every, every term has two derivatives. It should have. Okay, so gauge symmetry. This is a little, it's quite surprising how this works out. Um, 
I wish to emphasize this. Let me see. If you had a normal lead derivative of a tenth of a vector, say, what would you do? You would do psi p dp a m plus dm of psi p a p. Okay. Now, there is a reason, a very profound reason, why this normal lead derivative doesn't cut it here. And here is the reason. Um, what was all our problem or all the non-triviality of the theory is because the kalb ramon field has redundant gauge transformations. Some transformations that don't do anything to it. So remember we had psi m, the gauge parameters were the one forms and the fields. Now dm is, you know, I can put indices here, I think might help. dm is di and di tilde. So actually, look, if psi m is equal to dm of chi, any chi, it would be equal to di of chi and d tilde i of chi, and it would say the one form is trivial, and the vector is itself trivial, but because the dual coordinates. So this is a trivial gauge parameter. A psi, which is just a derivative of something, is a trivial gauge parameter. Now, the gauge transformations in gravity are lead derivatives. So would it be true, could we hope, that the gauge transformations of this theory are lead derivatives? Well, if a psi, which is dm of chi, generated no gauge transformation, it might make sense. So suppose this is a d chi of am. Let's see what we get. dp would be dp of chi, dp of am. Look, the constraint says this is zero. This is looking very good. Let's see here. Plus dm dp of chi times ap. And you say, no, it's not working. This thing is zero, generates a trivial gauge parameter, generates no lead derivative to this term, but it does generate this. So it's no good. So what do you do? We have to change the lead derivative a little bit. Is there a natural way to change the lead derivative? Well, the lead derivative was nice because you didn't have to use the metric, but we've admitted through the current bracket that using eta is not forbidden. So we're going to change the lead derivative into a generalized lead derivative, and we'll put this AP here. I'm very close to finishing, really. Um, and I'm going to add something in which the derivative that should have its index down can have it up because there's an eta. So I can add dp of psi m. Look, indices before in, with a lead derivative you distinguish very much covariant and contravariant, but now you're doubling. You have coordinates up and down, so in some sense it's more democratic to think of the index as having a covariant part and a contravariant part as well. Well, if we do that, this is the, the 
ODD index, so it is both derivatives. But it basically, you see, we always said that the derivative down is the one that exists, but then you can put an MN here, and that becomes the DN up. So look now, you had this term, and now you have minus DP, and Xi M is DM of Chi AP, and these two terms cancel. So this Lie derivative is the right Lie derivative. In this doubled stuff, you need to change it. And then what is the gauge transformation of this theory? Well, it's as nice as it could, you could hope now is simply that the gauge transformation of the metric HMN, index up or down with Xi, is just the generalized Lie derivative with respect to Xi of H. This is the gauge symmetry. One, the last exercise I wanted you to compute is uh, the following. Based on this thing, so I've done this. You can compute, we used to have that the lead derivative of one vector commutator with another vector is that a Lie derivative of the bracket. So what happens with this generalized Lie derivatives? Well, you know how it acts, for example, in an AM. So you can do the computation of the bracket of two generalized Lie derivatives, L psi 2. Probably you won't be too surprised that the answer is a generalized Lie derivative whose bracket is the C bracket we introduced half an hour ago. So because of this extra term, it's not the conventional bracket, but it's just the C bracket. And that shows that the algebra or the symmetry of this theory is in fact the C bracket. And in this notation is the easiest way to compute it. That's why. I left it to that level. So let me finish off now and um, write one more thing um, and leave the subject. I've shown you now two actions. They are t-duality invariant, and they use variables that are unusual. This second one is perhaps most unusual because it uses the generalized metric, and it's tied completely with uh, the doubling of the coordinates. In fact, it's a metric in the doubled space. It's a funny metric in the double space, but the action really treats it as a metric. So you can ask if there is such a thing as a generalized uh, Ricci curvature of this metric or generalized uh, scalar curvature? And the answer is that there is a generalized scalar curvature. There's a generalized Ricci curvature, and we don't know really if there's a generalized Riemann curvature. Um, this action that I wrote there can be written as integral dx dx tilde e to the minus 2 phi uh, d letter times something that we call r. And this action li differs by, by total derivatives from the action before. Um, so this r is not what is in parentheses there. It's a little different. It, there's a little bit of total derivative manipulation. In fact, r, as you will see in the notes, is something like 4 h m n d m d n dilaton 
it does have two derivatives, second derivatives. Just like in gravity, you cannot construct a scalar curvature with just one derivative. You need two derivatives. Now, I told you before, oh, you shouldn't have two of these derivatives, but two of these derivatives is no problem because they transform with a little h and the little h is constant. So this is ODD covariant, two derivatives is no problem, and it's ODD covariant and it's a generalized scalar. Only a peculiar combination of them is a generalized scalar, which means that delta psi of r is just psi m dm r. And if you want to prove the gauge invariance of that action, the ODD invariance is manifest. The gauge invariance is not manifest. The easiest way is to prove that this r is a scalar, because if this is a scalar and this is a density, the action is gauge invariant. So there is such a scalar, and uh, if you calculate it by setting the derivatives d tilde equal to zero, it turns out to be the scalar curvature plus four times box phi minus d phi squared minus one twelfth of h squared. So this is the peculiar combination. In general relativity, this is a scalar, and this is a scalar, and this is a scalar. But in generalized geometry, by the time you double, this, only this combination is a real scalar that is at the same time ODD covariant. So uh, that uh, really brings us to the end of this story. Uh, we don't know what will happen with this. Uh, it's a little early to know. Uh, at this moment, you could view this as ODD rewritings of Einstein's theory. We impose a strong constraint. Uh, that means that, in a sense, you really don't have the full power of double field theory. We should try either to do this without a constraint or find more sophisticated ways of learning about it. But even at this level, with a very strong constraint, we have seen a few nice things like Kurand brackets and generalized metrics emerging, and there is a hope that uh, a few more nice things will happen. Thank you very much for listening to the lectures and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you.